Okay, 42 years ago, all ah, right, I was 26 years old then, uh, and I was in India. This, this is my second trip, and I'm going to come back again in 42 years, if I'm alive, <laughs> in any event. So you can tell, this is me, and I had a mustache. Okay, let's talk about what culture and definitions. You heard me talk in the early part of the session, but it's the human use of and activities with wood, as well as attitudes towards wood, wood products, and wood-related environments. The value and the way we use wood in our society. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about the United States of America, one of the many countries in the world. If we use wood culture, what's positive about it? Why are we spending all our time on this? Because wood is an environmental material, and it's a sustainable material, and we've heard other speakers talk about. And wood use is the gateway to a sustainable future for mankind. And that's important, because as you heard, we're going to soon have 9 billion people in this world, and we're going to have to take care of them. Let's look at the United States, since I'm talking about it. It has a population of about 25% of India's, 312 million people. It's the third country in volume of standing timber. Timber growth still exceeds harvest. We are still producing biomass in timber products. The per capita yearly consumption of wood and fiber products in the U.S., you can read that, is four times the world average. We are a very consumptive country, and all the other countries would like to be as consumptive as we are. We use 25% of all the energy generated in the world, and only 3% of the energy is from wood and woody biomass. So let's put this in perspective. We use 25% of all the energy, and if we doubled the amount of energy that we use in biomass, we're still only talking about 6% of that 25%. So put that in perspective. Let's look at the percentages of the world total. We have 5% of the population. We have 7% of the land area. We have 8% of forest land. You can look at the woody biomass and timber inventory, but look at the last one, timber use for industrial products. We're over 20, we're 27 percent, a little bit more, I guess, on an update. So we consume a lot of timber products. Let's look at the United States. I assume some of you have visited or are from there. And anyway, if we, if we look at the East Coast, we find a lot of private lands in our country, and that's important because it's not owned by the government. There are rules, but they're managed differently. If you look at the West and you see all the orangish area, the public lands predominate. East Coast, we have deciduous trees, trees that you lose their leaves, oaks and cherries and other things like that. If you look at the West, we have softwoods, ponderosa pine. Other, other types of pine, Douglas fir. So that makes a pretty diverse country. And in the middle, what's in there? Well, we have some desert, but that's supposedly, especially uh, around this area, is the breadbasket of food for the world. We produce a lot of crops and ship them around the world. What's happened to our land area? Well, we're a relatively new country, if you want to look at it in perspective of when the European settlers came there. There were people around there for centuries. Look what happened around the late 1700s. All of a sudden, the forest land dropped and pretty much stabilized by 1900. Why did that happen? We'll look at some pictures. Because the settlers came in there and they cleared the land. Why'd they clear the land? Because it's more important to eat than it is to have wood products. So they made crops, which is why most of the land disappears in the world, to make crops to feed people. Let's look at growth and removals of U.S. forests. Interesting, everybody thinks that the United States is cutting down its timber. 
It's not cutting down its timber. If you can look at this graph, it's been increasing for some time, almost, since, well, since 1920, it went down a little, 1933, but it's going, been going up. And we're talking about growth versus removals. The growth is the top green. If the, the survey is done on a rotation, it's coming out soon, but basically, we're back to the removals of about 1960, which is about 400 million cubic uh, meters. The reason for that is, in case you haven't noticed, the United States has been going through an economic slump and housing starts have been way down, so we're not using as much timber. But we still are growing more timber. The only difference is, if you want to look at it, is the size of the material. We've cut down a lot of our very large timber. I think the same would be true of other countries around us, like Canada. Let's look at the United States. We're saying it's consumptive. You'll see all these countries that you could update this a little bit. I think China's moved a little bit since this data was taken, and perhaps some of the other countries. But you see the United States is by far the country that uses the most timber. And let's see, we have India right here. Very small amount, four, to four times our population, and they use a lot less timber. Let's look at the history, since that's what I said I was going to do it. How did wood culture and what did it do as it evolved in the United States? I have 15 minutes, this won't take long. I don't have them anymore. Early English settlers, 1607, Jamestown. What are they doing? They're cutting down trees. They're setting up camp. That's what happens on the East Coast, because that's basically where most of the settlers from Europe came. What happens as the time goes on? Settlers clear forests. What do they use? Wood products. Look at the wheels on that wagon. It's made of wood. Look at the chairs probably in the house, made of wood. Look at the cabin. It's made of wood. People are cutting down timber to make wood products and more importantly to grow crops, to feed the, the animals and everything else because you can't have grazing land with trees all over the place. So that's what happened in the United States. That's why the, tr that's why the curve dropped. What did they do as the country developed? One of the big things is because once you have cattle, you have to have fences to keep them in because we have private lands in the United States. You have to mark your land. So you mark them with a fence. And if you have animals, you keep those animals in with a fence. A lot of them were wooden fences. Tremendous amount of timber. Railroads came into the United States in the 1800s, early 1800s. By the middle 1800s, they were all the way across the country. Look at the trestles. They were all made of wood. Tremendous amount of wood. Look at harvesting and the way things were done. This was done around the turn of the century with with uh, uh, horses and stacked up very high. And those are those big timbers I was talking about. You can see the man on the top. Now we have feller bunchers that can cut trees down very quickly, but they don't have to cut the size of timbers. They do it in our country, they do it in Scandinavia, they do it in Australia, they do it all around the world. What happened in our country, even though timber didn't hurt? We had industry coming in and cutting lots of timber and clear cutting it because there was plenty of timber. Who cared? We could just cut it down, leave it there, wait till insects ate it, burned it. We also had tremendous forest fires in our country. And they cleared swaths of land throughout the country. So things were getting difficult in the United States with regards to timber products. Along came two important people, and this is a turning point in the United States. Gifford Pinchot, who was the first chief of the Forest Service. And the Forest Service was formed in 1905, and he was the first head of it, because he wanted the wise use of forest on federal lands. And I work for the Forest Service. We manage about 8% of the land mass of the United States, a lot. He says it should be open and accessible to all citizens. People should be allowed to use it. And we need to manage our forests. The president, which was more important, was Teddy Roosevelt. Maybe none of you have heard of him, but he was a pretty impressive president. He was very interested in natural resources. He was our conservation president. He put together branches of the government had had the lands and the research, which I ended up in research, and we started the Forest Service in 1905. And that was a turning point because federal lands were then managed. 
And research is needed because you have to know the implications of your management. When you manage something, you have to know what you're doing. How do you find that out? You try to do it through research, which I'm thoroughly, thoroughly committed to since I did it most of my career. Another thing is part of our wood culture grew a lot of stories. I guess many, maybe some of you have heard of Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. These people represented cutting trees down and forestry and especially popular in the northern part of our country like Minnesota and Wisconsin. You'll still see signs of it. But this is a representation of forestry and removal of forest material. And even though you remove forest material, it's not a necessarily a negative because human beings need resources to live, like shelter. Let's look at some of the solid wood products. Cedar chest, using cedar, probably from the East Coast. Bird's eye maple, this is a guitar, very unusual grain. Walnut gun stocks, people like to go hunting. These are some of the products that were used and are still used today. Composite products. Joices and glue lamps, engineered wood products for houses. We use all these materials now and we're advancing in these materials. Why do you think we have to use uh, oriented strand board and other materials and built up timber? Because we don't have the large trees we did centuries ago or even 50 years ago for that matter. But we're still using wood in a different form. Another thing that's popular in our country is wood plastic composite. That plastic is half wood pulp. So it's half monomer plastic and wood melded together and it has different features. People are using this for decks on their house which use a lot of wood. They also, if you go to seasides uh, where you have a deck that you walk along along the ocean, a lot of times it uses this. Everything has its good points and bad points. If you try to walk on this when it's very hot, it's much hotter than wood. Wood has more air. But this will not warp as much because it's plastic. Another big thing in our country is the carbohydrate economy, where we're taking wood, and we talked about that, the use of biomass. You can use it to make biodegradable plastics. After all, wood is mainly carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You can use it to make ethanol. So, we are trying to find other techniques to use wood. And we have wood that's very small diameter that we remove, and those are the important ones that we're trying to find other uses for. So that's become part of our wood culture now. That's the story of wood culture in the U.S. I have to give two pitches. I think I gave them early. Uh, I work many years for IUFRO, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. Uh, I now chair Wood Culture Working Party 510.01, where we push this forward. We talked about wood culture for the United States. It's true around the world. There's always an impact elsewhere. And you can read what the interdisciplinary values is. I've said it uh, in my earlier talks. But anyway, we're working on that. And in a practical basis, we're having our All Division 5 conference. We have them every five years. Those are the dates. We have two sessions on importance of wood cultures and Tomorrow resources, and another session, cultural artifacts, production and protection, which brings in two working parties. But anyway, if anyone is interested in the audience, we'd love to have more papers. Uh, we, the papers are due in the middle of November. And then the other one I pushed earlier was the International Wood Culture Society, is a nonprofit organization. They sponsored my talk. I'm very happy that they allowed me to come here and give what I consider important messages. And I thank you all for your attention. That's the end of my talk. <laughs>